Hi everybody, this is Aubrey Chavez from Faith Matters. We know it's been an eventful and uncertain and even scary couple of weeks for everybody. We've been grappling with our new normal just like everybody else and have been feeling the anxiety and isolation that we know a lot of people are. We asked Thomas McConkie to come on the podcast and share the way that he's been thinking about what's happening. Thomas always seems to have an ability to find calm in the middle of a storm, and we think that everybody that takes a moment to listen will really benefit from what he shares. As we spoke with him, he really helped us gain some insights that we think are transcendent, but also practical. We also wanted to highlight that Thomas is continuing his community mindfulness practice at Lower Light School of Wisdom, which normally meets in person, but has moved online. You can see the upcoming event dates at lowerlightswisdom.org. He'll also be starting the upcoming season of his podcast, Mindfulness Plus, a bit early in light of our current situation and is anticipating releasing his first episode on Wednesday, April 1st. So make sure to go subscribe if you're interested in hearing more insights from Thomas. We hope you enjoy this episode. Well, uh, Thomas, thank you so much for joining us today. I think this is um, timely. I I know that uh, in the world right now, as we're experiencing it, there is a lot of a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry, uh, even fear. Um, you know, people are dealing with feelings of isolation. And in my experiences with you, our experiences with you, we've always found you to be able to offer great insights that, um, in at least in our case, have been able to uh, bring us, uh, you know, a certain amount of uh, a certain amount of peace. And um, even the you know direct meditation practices that we've done with you have have uh, had a very calming effect. And so we. We felt like it would be great to bring you back on the podcast uh, today and just talk through some of the things that we we are feeling and we think are fe- being being felt broadly. So thank you, thank you so much as always for being here. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for having me back on, both of you. Of course. Thanks. So it occurred to me this morning, actually, I was we, I was thinking about this conversation, and I remembered um, I remember hearing you talk about the alembic, the metaphor of an alembic. Oh yeah. And I was like, oh man, that is. <laughs> <laughs> that is our life right now. And I, I remember hearing that before and feeling like that really resonated with me and yeah. the random daily stresses that would pop up. But, but now I feel that heat and that pressure. And, and I thought maybe that would be a good place to start this conversation. If you could just introduce the, our listeners to um, the Olympic and yeah, for that's, anyone who's never heard of that before. Well, we're off to a good start. I love any conversation that involves Olympics. Um, <laughs> The, so alembic, it's, it's an Arabic word, um, but it's used in the uh, Western Hermetic tradition specifically related to alchemy. So, you know, in pre-modern times, especially people related to alchemy as a literal science of transmuting lead into gold. Um, f- fewer people relate to alchemy that way in, you know, modern and postmodern times. But if you mine the tradition for wisdom and you look at the patterns and the revelations, that, if you will, that flow through that particular tradition, um, what you thinkers like Carl Jung, for instance, they recognize, wait a minute, there's, there's something subtle happening here. There's, there's a metaphorical transmutation of lead into gold. Mm-hmm. So the new relationship to Alembic, we could say, in you know, modern times is, you know, what is the crucible of life within which we live and how, how does the tremendous heat and pressure um, lead to our own transmutation? Or in an LDS context, it would be our divinization, our mm-hmm. um, celestialization and so on, sanctification. We have words for it, but um, it's a beautiful metaphor to me because it's so visceral, it's right, right? Like, you know, especially in, you know, love in the time of, COVID-19, we just feel yeah. like we're in a pressure cooker. So there's something yes. really vivid about the metaphor of an alembic, mixing all of these elements, adding heat and smelting out the impurities. So I'd say since you teed us up, which I'm happy you did, um, the question becomes, um, how can we use this alembic? How can we get our cook on in a way that smelts out our own impurities? And that's a painful question often (laughs) to ask, but here we are, you know, by necessity asking it. Yeah. I, I think I, I think that especially resonates with me now because I have this idea that anxiety and uncertainty is bad, that it's inherently bad. And I want to, I want to resist that and give, you know, find assurances that the worst won't happen. And, and so this metaphor of the Olympic feels like it's turning that totally upside down. And, and it's this idea that, that's actually what I need. That it's good. Like the, I can sit with the uncertainty and find and and 
those base metals will be transmuted to gold, you know, and, and it just, yeah. it changes everything. It makes it feel like I can handle, I can sit with the pressure a little longer because it's not actually going to kill me. Beautiful. Um, if, if I were to imagine Christ on the cross and, you know, this is my own imagination. So take it with a grain of salt and, you know, see what relates to you. But if I were to imagine Christ on the cross in, you know, his glory, but also in his humanity, I personally imagine he had an awareness, uh, maybe even a gratitude for the pain he was feeling in that moment. Because, mm -hmm. you know, to an awakened mind and heart, such as Christ, there's a recognition that pain is uh, not just meaningless, happening to random beings in a random universe, but pain actually makes something deeper possible. And we, we see that in Christ's life. Um, I, the expression through the Christian tradition of not my will, but thine be done. And the, the deep willingness that comes from the depths of Christ's spirit and soul when he says that, to me, it's a bit of a blueprint to how we can relate to pain and discomfort in our lives, anxiety, depression, everything else you named or we haven't named. These are modern examples of pain that we're asked to endure. And I notice when I relate to anxiety in a way like, oh, I'm anxious, how do I do something to get unanxious? That leads down a particular path. And we can talk more about it, it's not a bad path. But if it's the only path I have, every time I feel anxious, I have to scramble to not feel anxious. Um, mm -hmm. We realize that we're in a particular kind of hell. And that yeah. like, you know, the way T.S. Eliot describes it in The Wasteland, um, I won't quote the whole line, it's maybe too literary, but he describes hell as a place where we can neither stand, nor lie, nor sit. Oh it's my like, gosh. No, no, right, like no matter wow. what we do, it's not okay. And yeah. that is the wasteland of humanity. That is samsara of Buddhism. That is the fallen world of Christianity. And we know it well and we're learning it. We're exposed to it in this situation in a new way where like we used to have like a hundred tricks to not feel whatever we were feeling. And mm -hmm. now maybe we have three or four. Mm -hmm. And even those tricks are kind of wearing on us <laughs> and yeah. not even those are working. So there's, there's an Alembic cooking us here metaphorically and if we can tap into our own willingness to experience the experience god offers us to live mm. through that willingness what i find is we we naturally fall into a kind of gratitude of what this pain and discomfort are making possible so when i when i hear you talk about this i'm imagining sort of a a diverging path, you know, and this, this part of the path is in my, the first part before it's diverged to me is the portion that has been, uh, been thrust upon us, you know, the challenges that we've been presented with. Right. And then something uh, is going to cause us to either go down one side where it, it does end up being sort of a, um, a, a force for transmutation or divinization or whatever we want to mm -hmm. call it. And then the other path is one that you could very easily go down, I think, that leads to more just, uh, you know, uh, embitterment or resentment or <clears throat> those kinds of things. What, what yeah. would you say lies at that intersection? What's the, the hinge that gets, is it, and I, you've talked a little bit about this, but is it just sort of that, is it, is, is it words like willingness and acceptance and awareness that, that get you, you know, right. on, that, on that path that we'd like to be on? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a beautiful question. And I, these days, for better or for worse, I find the most honest answer is usually I don't know. And in this moment, it happens to be that answer. <laughs> Actually, I don't know what allows it. But what's in my heart when you ask it is faith. Like when you were describing that fork in the road, what came up in my response really spontaneously was faith. And, and what mm -hmm. that means to me is a faith in the way things are, a faith in the fundamental goodness of God and life. And if, if we live in faith, if we live as an expression of faith, then, you know, in a given moment, we feel really anxious or we feel like we're crawling up the walls because the kids are all on top of us. And 
how long is this quarantine? Is it a week more? Is it a year more? And like, is it yeah. right? right. But, but if we like fall back into a profound faith and like, oh, this anxiety is purifying. This yeah. anxiety I'm feeling right now is sanctifying. That's a real leap of faith because it would be just as reasonable to say like, I'm going to pull my hair out and I'm going to go crazy and I can't make it. And that would be a reasonable thing to say. So mm-hmm. yeah, that, that exercise of faith and the goodness of every last thing we're feeling and the faith that, you know, these experiences are consecrated for our good. You've heard that mm-hmm. line. Yeah. It's a good line. <laughs> yeah. At one of my favorite um, other lines, one of my favorite lines from navigating more in faith crisis is, oh. um, to- you know, a totally different context, a different type of anxiety that you're talking about. But um, you wrote, something about what can this current disorienting dilemma um, point to? Like how, what, what kind of new faith does this point to and what in me is dying and right. what in me is being resurrected? And right. that's played over and over. Like why this hurts mm-hmm. because something in me is dying. Those, those things that I'm attached to are, are falling away. And that, that, that's a really painful experience, but it's not bad for me. You know, Absolutely. I need to let those things go. Yeah. Absolutely. No, it's, it's, it's how we grow and it's how we transform. And uh, the most transformative experiences, not always, but are often the most painful ones in my experience. Mm, yeah. Joy is transformative in its own right. And there's something about pain that's a sacrament in human yeah. life. I'm curious if you, so for those living in the Salt Lake area, we had an earthquake in the middle of all of this COVID-19 uh, right. on the 18th of March. And I, I remember I talked to my sister that day and she lives a little closer to the epicenter. And she said, I was just, I was shaking. I was shaking until like two o'clock in the afternoon. And, and so I wonder if you could talk about what you do when I think a lot of people are experiencing these really acute feelings of anxiety. It's not, it's not, you know, there's this general um, like collective uneasiness but then we I think a lot of people are going to have these experiences where very suddenly something goes wrong you you (laughs) find out that you're being laid off or you find out that you're sick or someone you love is sick or there's an earthquake or you know and what do you do could you give us some really practical ideas for how to feel peace when you're when it is in your body when you're just you're you're not very aware and you can just feel your whole self succumbing to this feeling of you know, being out of control and being anxious. And it's like the hell you described, you know, you can't, there's right. nothing you could do, you know, right. when you're just in there, like how do you pull yourself back and remember it's okay to feel afraid and uncertain and yeah. get back into that place of right. finding peace somehow in the discomfort. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's a great question. And it so happens that I don't know is not the response that's coming up right now. I actually have a, <laughs> Hopefully an intelligible response to that. I don't know what kind of podcast this would be. I said, I don't know. Yeah. Good luck with that anxiety, Aubrey. Um, well, first, like, I want to, uh, I want to pick up a passage um, from a book. This is, uh, this is a book by Kabir Helminski, who's regarded as a master in the Sufi tradition okay. from Islam. And um, he, he writes something that's really important here, and then I'll, get into like a more direct answer or okay. response to your question. Here in this passage, Helminski is just a, he's a lovely writer and a lovely person. And um, he's talking about how essentially ideas can't save us. He, like ideas can help us like open up to new possibilities, like true principles and ideas can help us perceive the world and ourselves more as they are. But an idea isn't enough. Something like deep has to transform in us. I guess to drop down into the body and the very heart of who we are. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the context here. And so he says, you know, like ideas are really helpful and they can open us up to new perception, but they're not enough. And he goes on to say, eventually, those ideas that support the experience of unity and presence. So when, like, in unity and presence, think when Christ says, "I and the Father are one." But it's a mm. classical you know, Christian statement in scripture on unity. Like, you know, we are the light in and through all things. We're made up of the same stuff as the eternal God. Um, so these ideas that support the perception of unity 
um, they can deepen and refine our capacity for that perception over time. But the ideas aren't enough. And then he, this is what he writes that really like, struck me. It felt like a very beautiful and humble thing to write. He says, imagine if these words of Jesus were to become our reality. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Mm. So that's Matthew 6. But, but that sentence leading into the scripture, he says, imagine if these words of Jesus were to become our reality. And I'm struck by that humility. This is a Sufi master who, you know, tens of thousands of people have looked to for wisdom. And it doesn't feel like a false humility when he writes, what if this were our, our reality? Acknowledging that this is not my reality yet. There are times when I'm pulled into anxious mind, seeking mind, into doubt, into despair. But what if yeah. this were our reality? Yeah. So I love this because Helminski is just acknowledging as a human being like ourselves that like, we all have been exposed to beautiful truths and beautiful mm -hmm. ideas. Is it our moment to moment reality? Mm -hmm. You know, that, oh, like when, when my house felt like it was going to fall over at 7.09 a.m. on March 18th, my first thought was not, Heavenly Father loves me. <laughs> that, that was not my reality. My reality was like some expletive that I'm not going to say on the podcast. <laughs> and it, it was like, oh, quarantine and I'm going to be homeless in five minutes. Yeah. And it, it was like full body panic. Like, what does that mean yeah. to be in quarantine and homeless and it's cold outside? And, you know, mm -hmm. like I, I had a hundred thoughts in five seconds mm -hmm. and that was my lived reality. So yeah. I just like it, to just help all of us, the three of us talking right now, but those of us listening in the conversation to just cut ourselves a break and acknowledge that, yeah, we know beautiful truths through revelation, through scripture, through the guidance of our, you know, prophet and leaders and so forth, the wisdom of our grandmothers. Mm -hmm. And we haven't lived into those truths yet. We haven't. And back to the Alembic, this cook that's happening right now, in my experience, this is the way God prepares <clears throat> human beings for eternity. God's got to cook it out of us, like everything that's not divine and uh, yeah. transfigured, God's got to cook it out of us. And I actually find a tremendous amount of comfort and peace in that. Like, oh, it's okay that I'm still a human and I still freak out. Like, I'm a mindfulness teacher and I freaked out when the earthquake came. Like, <laughs> it's, it's a relief that we can still be human, but it also yeah. points us to this reality that um, something, in my experience, often deeply graceful and merciful is also happening. Mm. So that's yeah. the framework. That's, yeah, that's the I love, setup to I love the that. question. And Tim, I don't know if you had something, but then I got a little exercise for us. Oh, oh, yes. let's do it. Oh, that's that perfect and right up. No, you yeah. go ahead. You, I won't forget it. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, I, I was going to ask, I mean, there's this, I, I, th this idea that we can, you know, we can suffer and, and it, there, that suffering is a, uh, an important part of the mortal experience. And it's something that regardless of, um, regardless of how, you know, mindful we may, we may become um, is, is always going to be part of our experience. Mm -hmm. I know that Richard, uh, Richard Rohr likes to say that great suffering leads to great love. And yeah. he, and he sees it as this sort of uh, transformative experience. And there are many different uh, frameworks I know, and you're, you're familiar with, um, and even professionally work with certain adult development frameworks, but are there, uh, are there some uh, specific frameworks that come to mind that say, you know, in some way, the, a, a great amount of suffering, like are we saying, maybe it's just this general difficulty that we're going through, maybe it is more acute for, for some people, you know, um, what do you, what, what do those traditions or, um, or frameworks have to say about where this, where this really could lead? Yeah, well, I wanna really understand your question, so let me feed it back to you. I, I hear you asking like whatever tradition we're drawing from, whatever meaning we're making of it, is there something they point to in terms of the opportunity for how yeah. to work with suffering in a way that's transformative, is that? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Well, 
Yeah, I'll say like in Richard Rohr's statement, I feel that implicitly, um, maybe in the like longer passage that that quote is drawn from, it says this explicitly, but I imagine somewhere in there is an intention for conscious suffering. There, there's something, there's suffering, which we all do. Um, not all of us suffer consciously or the way I phrased it a moment ago, suffer with a sense of deep faith that like this, this suffering is consecrated. It's a sacrament that I'm offered to take, you know, take this into me fully. Um, and what I'm really struck by, uh, I, I've studied deeply in the Buddhist tradition for years, and I'm really struck at how resonant the insight in Buddhism is to Christianity. We talk about Christ's willingness to take on the form of a slave and suffer in Christianity. Uh, in Buddhism, it's, it's phrased as a kind of, not willingness, but an equanimity and openness to mm. the rising and passing of experience. Uh, I could talk more about it, but they're remarkably similar. So in, in, in response to your question, um, my sense is that like the wisdom traditions, they've noted in their own way that suffering exists and that it's not the quantity of suffering that matters so much as like our attitude, our relationship to the suffering that mm -hmm. can be spiritually transformative and catalytic. So that's really good news. It means it depends on us. It means like, yeah, I was relieved that the earthquake didn't bring my house down. But had it brought my house down, and it still could, we're still in like afterquake land here in Salt Lake, then I have an opportunity, I have a choice of how I'm going to relate to that. Mm -hmm. And if it's, if it's like a contraction and a despair and a rage at why me, you know, that's a, that's a particular quality of suffering. And if it's a quality of, you know, like this too is consecrated for my good there's that path. Yeah. So mm -hmm. whatever words we use to describe the path, I, I sense there's something deeply common in our humanity and we know from our own experience what it's like to open up to the grace of change and what it's like to just like shake our fists and mm -hmm. beat our chests and rent our garments and all that, you know, biblical stuff. We know what that feels like too. So in that spirit, I'd love to just offer like a one, two, three, four. And, um, you know, hopefully Please. you find this exercise really helpful. I know I have over the years. Um, and, you know, you can uh, come back to it often as the heat turns up in the Alembic and as the quarantine draws on. Um, let's start with just acknowledging how much anxiety and uncertainty, uncertainty we feel. And, you know, just to evoke the spirit of that, let's start with, um, we don't know how long we're going to be quarantined. We don't know how many people are going to die. Even after the first wave of this virus, we don't know if there's a COVID-20 around the corner that's even more lethal. This is starting to get intense already. I'm, gonna, I'm about to stop with my, I don't know, because I'm like, okay, it sucks. <laughs> Um, but maybe just for good measure, we don't know how profoundly this global health crisis is going to affect our finances. Um, we don't know if the people closest to us are going to make it out. There are a lot of things we don't know right now. And I don't know is the recipe for anxiety in a human being. Um, mm -hmm. If we look at ourselves from a biological point of view, the body wants to be comfortable and the mind wants answers. And whenever the body's not comfortable, it's cold, it's hungry, it's in a strange place, anxiety. Mm -hmm. And whenever the mind is confused and its normal reference points are stripped away from it, anxiety. And anxiety is a powerful thing. It's a gift, you could say, of our humanity because it mobilizes energy uh, towards solution. Um, there are times when it's very skillful to be ang anxious and that anxiety mobilizes us to move towards a better situation. I'm anxious about being hungry. I'm going to go find food. And that, you know, that energy is going to keep me vigilant and on task until I'm fed yeah. and I can relax. There, there are times it's profoundly skillful. And then I would say there are times like, let's go back to the earthquake 
Tuesday morning. Was it Tuesday? It was the 18th. I think it was a Tuesday. Was um, Tuesday? <clears throat> March 18th uh, at 7.15. No, it was still skillful to worry then because Glow and I, my wife and I, we started throwing together an emergency preparedness kit, packing day bags, throwing it in the trunk. There, We scrambled for a while. It's like, okay, we read up online. Oh, there's a 5% chance in the next seven days there's going to be an even bigger earthquake. That's way too high for comfort. There's a 17% chance there's going to be like another earthquake that size. So it's like we got informed. We uh, made preparations as best we could. And then, you know, by three in the afternoon, it's like, well, now we hurry up and wait. But I'm still feeling really, really anxious. And this is, this is the key. This is where the practice starts, and I'll invite us into it uh, momentarily. Um, at that point, when we've done everything we can, uh, reading the news again and scouring the internet and obsessing about, like, <laughs> did I get every last thing right? And then, like, just, like, watching my walls to see if they're shaking. Like, that's corrosive to me. That anxiety yes. is going to eat a hole in my body, and it's going to rob me of any peace, of any faith, in the way things are and i'm in that hell realm where i'm just not okay no matter what happens i'm not okay so we have to learn to really differentiate between anxiety that signals danger and anxiety that doesn't signal danger because our bodies are wired to feel anxious no matter what and that doesn't necessarily mean it's a clear indicator that yeah i've got to do something right now does that make sense yeah totally so let's, let's jump into it. Um, there's a lot of things we don't know, and that causes a lot of anxiety. So take a moment to just open up to everything you don't know right now. <clears throat> Think about the most disturbing things, just for a moment. You can, you know, keep your hand on the faucet, so to speak. You can crank up the anxiety if you want, if you're feeling like gifting yourself with more anxiety or, or just a little bit, but just as an exercise, like think about the things that are most disturbing to you right now in life, whatever those are. And I'll just give you a second. And, and just so you can follow along in my adventure, the first thing that comes to mind is my wife just hit her third trimester today. And we don't know what the impact would be on the baby if, Glow got sick in the next three months. So that's, that's significant anxiety for me. So once you have contact with some anxiety, the next step is to like really bring all of your attention to it in the body. Just notice where anxiety is coming up in the body. How do you know you're anxious? Something's happening in the body where you know you're anxious. So just allow your attention to move there and, you know, uh, notice the quality of anxiety. In other words, notice the physical sensations associated with the anxiety. For example, I feel a, a kind of pit in my, in my chest. I feel a tight, a slight tightening of my throat. So as you do this, as you describe the sensations to yourself, take care to not include any emotions, not any stories or interpretations about what it means, just strictly physical sensation. I feel a, like a heat in my chest. I feel a, like a clenched jaw, just strictly physical sensation. And once you've really described the sensations objectively, no emotion, no interpretation, just sensation, then ask yourself on a scale of zero to 10, how intense the sensations are physically. Zero means undetectable, there's nothing there. 10 means off the charts, you're freaking out, full on meltdown. And just notice like how much anxiety, how much sensation is present. And for me in this moment, it's like somewhere between a two and a three. It's there. It's uncomfortable. I don't like it, um, but I don't feel like I'm going to die. Maybe yours is higher. Maybe it's lower. Just notice. And this process helps us kind of name and tame, just, you know, wrap our heads around what's happening in the body.
And the next step, and this is a really important step, and this is what helps us really like differentiate between life-threatening and just normal human anxiety. This next step is to ask yourself the question really honestly, honestly, is there evidence in my direct experience right now that I'm in physical danger? Right? Is there actual evidence that I'm in harm's way right now? For example, is my throat, that constricting around the throat, is it so constrictive that I'm going to suffocate and I need to call a paramedic? No. <laughs> okay, it's uncomfortable, but no. What about the heat in my chest? Is it so hot that it's going to disrupt my heartbeat and I'm gonna go into cardiac arrest? No, that's silly, I'm fine, but I'm really uncomfortable, right? And notice, this is really important. If there were an earthquake happening right now, if I'm anxious and I can see like the wall shifting, it's like, yeah, there's mm -hmm. a lot of evidence I'm in danger. So yeah. <laughs> this question isn't just a throwaway. It's not always a no, but, but it's informative because it's usually a no. 99.9% .9 of the time in modern life, we feel a lot of intensity in the body, but it's not a signal that we're actually in physical danger. And so we use our mind to clarify that fact. And so having gotten really clear, like, okay, I feel disturbance in my body. I feel uncomfortable sensation, but I also feel totally certain that it's not signaling to me that there's danger in my environment. Okay, so there's no danger. It means I can commit even more to the sensation. I can go even deeper. And this is counter instinctual because everything yeah. about me wants to not feel it. I want to do something to make it go away. But I already realized that there's no danger in the environment. So there's nothing to do. There's nothing to do but feel it a little bit more, apparently. So I'm just going to commit to actually feeling the intensity. So you can just stay with that for a moment and just feel the cook of the Alembic here. This is the cook that smelts out the dross. <sighs> and the next step, <clears throat> one declaration we can make that is actually surprising but powerful. We can declare to ourselves or we can declare out, out loud from the rooftops if we want that I commit to feeling this way on and off the rest of my life. And this is crazy because to the animal body, it's like, no, I don't want to feel this way ever again. But we already established we're not in danger. So it's okay if we feel this way on and off for the rest of our lives because it's not dangerous. And what we find in this step, uh, one of two basic possibilities, we either feel profound relief because it's like, oh, it seemed like a problem, but I guess this will just come and go as long as I'm an alive, embodied, sensitive being. I'm gonna feel this way from time to time and that's totally okay. And notice, just like that, we've gone from the hell realm of I'm not okay and it's mm -hmm. not okay to, oh, I guess I can feel this way on and off the rest of my life and it's, it's okay. Right? Yeah. So that's a, this is a profound shift. To, it's like a neuro hack. We use our mind to clarify the true experience of the body and we come to a new place. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm disturbed, I'm uncomfortable and I'm deeply okay. That's yeah. surprising. The other possibility is that I am deeply committed to my fantasy that one day I'll never be disturbed again. And so I commit to feeling this way on and off the rest of my life. And I feel like really devastated, like really on and off for the rest of my life. That sounds awful. But if we examine that, we realize, oh, I'm actually hanging on to this fantasy. Like I, I was born into a human body to be comfortable and to never be disturbed. But mm -hmm. we know from the depths of wisdom in our own tradition that we, we are born into a physical body precisely to be disturbed 
and to endure pain and trials and tribulation and to consecrate those. So yeah. if, you, if you commit to feeling your disturbance on and off and feel really like bummed out, it's like, oh crap, this is an awful exercise. I can't believe I tuned into Faith Matters today. <laughs> you can realize like, oh, that, that indicates that I'm invested in a fantasy that human life should be really comfortable all the time. Mm -hmm. And even that is its own grace where it's like, oh, actually, when I say that out loud, that sounds crazy. I, <laughs> I know, but I know I'm not supposed to be comfortable all the time. I commit to feeling disturbed on and off the rest of my life. Oh, that actually feels a little better that time. Mm -hmm. right. So that's kind of the therapeutic version. But if we were oh. to add a religious layer to it, which I quite like to do, it's after making sure we're not in harm's way, but committing to our mortal experience more fully in this moment, it's something like a declaration that I have faith that even this is consecrated for my own good. And see what that feels like when you're disturbed, when you're anxious, when you can neither stand nor lie nor sit in this world. Mm -hmm. And you, you escape not from the body, but you escape into the body and you allow yourself to be thoroughly disturbed and you declare to yourself, I have faith that even this is already consecrated for my own gain. And when I do that in this moment, I feel a profound love and care for who I am and who I'm becoming. And I'm aware that there's nothing I can experience in this body that is separate from that grace. And that's, that's a little bit of how we cook in the Alembic. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> Thank you so much, man. I, nothing, you know, nothing feels ironically safer than being able to face the deepest fear, you know, the worst exactly. feelings and just, and just look at it and, and accept it. it it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. It, no, that what you said is profoundly wise. Um, we think that manipulating the conditions of our life endlessly, neurotically, is what's going to make us feel safe. But that actually just reinforces yeah. our doubt that things aren't okay and that yeah. I need to like run around and fix them. But what you just said is exactly that opposite mind. It's the, you know, to me, it's starting to approximate the mind of Christ where we realize, mm -hmm. oh, like nothing could be safer than to just like be yeah. here in the present moment and accepting of what my life is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we learned this from a person who was nailed to a cross in his early 30s. Um, life doesn't get much worse. Yeah. I love the word fantasy that you used in there. We have a, a, we have a potential fantasy that we'll never have to feel like this again. And I think there are all types of fantasies that we, uh, that we enjoy, not just, not just that we'll uh, experience peace for the rest of our lives, but that we'll be healthy or that we'll yeah. be wealthy or that we'll achieve certain things or that we'll have many years with our loved ones. Yeah. And those may not, those stories that we write for ourselves, um, often we have no true control over. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I love applying sort of that, uh, that exercise that you went through, not just, to the, not just to the idea that we could have peace, but to any of, any of the stories that we've, that we've written about ourselves that we so yeah. want to hold on to. Beautifully said. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Okay, is there anything else, Thomas? I can't imagine. That, I, I feel like I just need to go sit with this and yes. I think about this daily. You know, I like if I woke up with that practice, if that's what I did in the morning, I feel like I feel like everything would feel different. You know, I I, I this is exactly the opposite. I think of what I do naturally, right? Like I try not to think about it. Or I yeah. try to reassure myself that right. there are five reasons why the worst won't happen, and right. and it just feels it feels so freeing to do the opposite, to feel the thing I'm afraid to feel yeah. and, and accept the thing I'm afraid will happen, that it could happen. And, and just, I don't, I want, I want to sit in that kind of peace every day. If, if yeah. that's how we started the day, I think I could, this, this 
quarantine could be a gift. You know? Yeah, no, <laughs> like, absolutely. You know, I, I hope that's like what this whole conversation and meditation brings us to is mm. like, how do we really relate to the quarantine as a gift? From the perspective of natural man, natural woman, it's mm -hmm. just endlessly maddening trying to like keep it all together. How do I just yeah. keep it all together and get through this? But if we reorient like we have been in this conversation, and, and you already gave voice, both of you gave voice to this so beautifully, but as we start to open up to the Christ life that desires to be born within us and expressed through us, there are no more conditions that control there, there's nothing yeah. else to do but just live the blessing of the grace of, you know, what God prepares. And it's, that can sound like a really glib, obnoxious thing to say if you say it to the wrong person at the wrong time. But it's, it's, it's the gospel we yearn for. You know? Yeah, that, I mean, that's the gold, right? Like, that's, the, that's what it's transmuted into, just this, yeah. this release of needing to control anything. Yeah. And that's the transcendent faith. Totally. So notice, like, you know, we've been on a little journey here on the podcast. Like, if we just rest in ourselves for a moment, because you just named what I was feeling, Aubrey. Like, here's the gold. Here's the alchemy. This is the life of Christ um, mm -hmm. living through us and rising within us. Like, what does it feel like to just rest in ourselves for a moment now, knowing that like absolutely every last aspect of this experience in this moment is okay and that it's consecrated, that it's gilded mm -hmm. to just rest in it for a moment. So it's, it's my hope that all of humanity, um, as best we can, is, you know, working through this, this smelting process. It's painful. I've felt tremendous pain myself. I, I know others are as well. So. Thomas, could you just really quickly, before we let you go, talk yeah. about what you're doing at, um, at Lower Lights for people that may want more of this or may just need uh, more, you, you know, human contact or, or community? I'd be happy to. Well, one thing I want to say, um, it's felt important not to, oh, and I'm recognizing the irony of this, as I said, it's felt important not to um, immediately shift all of Lower Lights activity to Zoom, like to online mm -hmm. offerings, because like, I think I've been in quarantine one day where I read some article I can't remember it was the New York Times. It's like, humanity is learning to live online. I'm like, really? It's been less than 24 hours and now we need to live online? Um, like this conversation to me has been a testament of, okay, like, yeah, live online and connect to the people you love and be generous with you know, yourself and your resources and don't let this crisis go to waste. Like, let's, mm. let's notice the pain of isolation. Let's consecrate mm. that too. That said, you know, Lower Lights, um, we have, uh, th we've had three offerings a month um, for the last few years. Um, and they're, they're gatherings, you know, that now are online. And people can call into them. You can read about them on lowerlightswisdom.org. Um, and their, their meditative process is similar. Like, it's in the spirit of the practice we just did. It's less about kind of bringing up new ideas and it's more about how do we embody these truths and really become them and live them and manifest them so that happens three times a month right now and people can check that out online and i also decided i'm gonna um boot up the podcast a little early this year so Yay! mindfulness plus and, I, and i'm just gonna like because it doesn't make sense to do anything else i'm just gonna start with like <laughs> the COVID 19 season oh so it'll That's just so be, great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. So, you know, I think those will be released starting next Wednesday. Um, so there'll be like a little bit of like a practice people can work with. Okay. And then, you know, a place to meet where we can like go over the practices together and just be in presence um, in the community. So that's, that's pretty much what's happening at Lower Lights these days. Okay. Yeah. Thomas, excited. that was really, that was really <laughs> just so, so wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate you guys. Yeah. And thanks for having the conversation with me. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thanks so much for listening, and thank you especially to Thomas for coming on. We found this conversation to be so healing and helpful for us, and we hope that you did too. And again, please check out more of what Thomas is doing at lowerlightswisdom.org and at the Mindfulness Plus podcast. We hope everybody is staying healthy and safe, and as always, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.